Yeah, like I said, I've, it seems like uh, Easter is, uh, like I said, for a lot of people it's family, for some people it's a, a weekend off work, uh, Sunday it seems like a lot of businesses are closed and things like that, and like I said, I, I spent time with Tina and we spent time uh, getting outfits for the girls and we spent time uh, going out and uh, getting the food prepared and different things like that, and of course there's the candy and the baskets and those things. And we did all that, and I, as I was noticing, I just noticed the people out, and I noticed them doing things and trying to get ready for this special day. And I thought, what a special day it is for us that are Christians, people that are born again, that we, we know Christ our Savior. It's the day that we get to celebrate that He rose from the grave. We get to celebrate that He's coming again, and He's coming back for us. And we get to know that beyond a shadow of a doubt. And all week long, I was thinking, I was like, man, what did, what did you go through the week before this, Jesus? What... I'm sure your week was nothing like our week. I think sometimes we think we had a bad week, and we think maybe things aren't working out the way we want them to work out. And I think Jesus probably had one of the worst weeks ever. I think we could never compare our lives to His and what He went through for us and the week that He had before He died on the cross, the week that He had before He, he went, went and walked that road carrying that cross, and He was beaten, beaten beyond recognition, brutally beaten. And then he, he was put in a tomb, and he was put on the cross, and then after that he was put in a tomb, and on the third day he rose. And I wanted to talk to you about that this morning. I wanted to talk to you what Jesus experienced before Easter. And I'm going to show you what he experienced at the hand of men, and at the hand of different men, and what different men to, did to him, and different men had a part in his life. And the most important thing, like I said, is that we become the man at the end. I think that's what we should be. The past six weeks for the religious world has been a season of Lent. For those of you that do not know what that season of Lent is, let me explain it to you. According to the religious community, it's a solemn religious observant. In the calendar, many Christian denominations begin on Ash Wednesday and covers a period of approximately six weeks before Easter Sunday. The traditional purpose of Lent is the preparation of the believer through prayer, penance, repentance of sins, almsgiving, atonement, and self-denial. This religious event, along with this Customs are observed by so-called Christians in the Anglican, Lutheran, Methodist, and Roman Catholic traditions. Today, some that say they're Baptists even and evangelical churches also observe the Lenten season. Its purpose is a heightened and annual commemoration of Holy Week, marking the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm explaining this because I don't think a lot of Baptists even know what it is. I had talked to a lady last week, and, and she's here, and she, she knows who she is, and she asked me, you know, do we observe Lent? What is, you know, and she knows what Lent is. She, she was a Catholic. And um, she asked me, she's like, you know, do we observe it? Do we not? And she's asking her husband. And I was just explaining to, to those of you, a lot, of, a lot of Baptists don't know what it is. It recalls the tradition and events of the crucifixion of a New Testament, sorry, beginning on Friday sorrows, further climaxing on the crucifixion and on Good Friday, which ultimately culminates in the joy celebration on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. During Lent, the religious community to commit to fasting or giving up certain types of luxuries as a form of penance. Many Christians, sad to say, also have uh, spiritual disciplines such as reading a daily devotional, draw themselves to God, the station of the cross, the devotional commentation of Christ carrying the cross, and the execution are often observed. Many Roman Catholic, some Protestant churches remove flowers from their altars while crucifixes, religious statues, and other elaborate religious symbols are often veiled in violet fa fabric, solemn observance of the event. Throughout the religious community, some mark the season with the traditional absentation from the conception of meat, most only among Ro Roman Catholics. At Swan Baptist Church, we don't observe Lent. Um, we, uh, we do not recognize the season of Lent nor the Holy Week as something that a believer in Jesus Christ should do for several reasons. And hear me out. Don't, don't turn off your ears and think, I don't want to hear it. I'm already turning off. Just, just let me explain to where I'm coming from. We do not believe that the focus ever should be on a self-denial of a person. Rather, should the focus should always be on the crucifixion of Jesus. If there's one word that I think Swanton Baptist should be about, if there's one word that I would love for them to know us in the community and love to know me, is, is, is that what we believe and what we preach is Jesus. That's all we believe and that's all we preach. And if you continue preaching that, you'll never go wrong. And if you continue to follow Him, I promise you, you'll never go wrong. There's nothing that you can do with your flesh that will gain favor for salvation of Jesus Christ. The Bible says that there's none righteous, no, not one. We can't jump high enough. We can't live good enough. 
We can't spend enough money. We can't have enough ability. We can't say enough prayers to get ourselves into heaven. The only one thing that will get us into heaven, according to the Bible, is if we accept Christ as our personal Savior. That's the only thing. That's the only thing that will ever get you to heaven. Now, I'm telling you right now, the last thing that, that our Lord will ask when we get to heaven, when we get to the judgment, the last thing He's going to ask is where you went to church. He's going to ask what you did with this son. That's what he's going to ask. That's all he cares about. We don't believe that we should have a token religious life. We believe that every day is a holy day. That's what I'm talking about. I believe that every day is a holy day. Every day that I get up and I get to experience life and I get to take breath in these nostrils, that's a holy day to me. That's the day that God's given me an extra day, a day that I should take advantage of. Also, we believe that every day is a day that we should be consecrated. Every day we should try to be separated. We should try to, try to get closer to God. We should try to do more things to achieve closeness with Him and get rid of the things that separate us from Him. Also, as a Christian, every day is a day that a Christian should have saying from things that the Bible's against. The Bible strictly and vehemently says things that it's against, and it tells us. It's a, I'm a mechanic, and those of you that don't know it, uh, we have parts books, and we have instruction books, and we have things that help us put things together. But us as men, we like to take those books, and we like to throw away the instructions. We like to put it all together. I'm a man. I'm going to put this swing set together. I put my kid's swing set together a couple years ago. It literally took me a week. I will never buy another one of those swing sets again. And I'm a mechanic with 20 years of experience. But this Bible, this book that God gave us is instruction for our life. God gave it to us to follow the instructions. But what we like to do is we go through life and we like to throw away that Bible. We like to throw away everything it's against. It's got too many rules. It's got too many regulations. This is here for help. And this will help, your, help yourself. So I'm Baptist Church is about the person of Jesus Christ. We're not about symbols. not about crucifixes. We're not about sacraments. We're about one thing. Jesus Christ. That's the one thing we're about. We do not believe that a holy week should be a reason for heightened devotion to Jesus Christ. We believe that the Holy Spirit on the inside of us should give us a heightened relationship with Christ. It should give us a heightened uh, joy in our Christian walk. It, it's Him living on the inside when we accept Him as our personal Savior. That's what lifts us up, and that's what makes us believe what we believe. However, I do believe that we need to separate the Lenten season from what actually happened before Easter and before the rising of Jesus Christ. That was the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior. He died on a cross. It was horrible. And I'm not even going to go into the details this morning of the beating that he took and the spit that ran down his beard and his face and how they ripped out his beard and how they did all those things to him. I'm not even going to talk to that. I'm going to talk to more of the emotional side of it this morning, more kind of the things that we go through as, as people on earth and Christians. That was the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Without the crucifixion, you can't have the resurrection. You have to have one with the other. A lot of people, they want to say, on, and I know this is not the typical Easter message, and a lot of people, they want to, they want to go out of here and they want to feel good and they, they want to feel uplifted. But I believe we as Christians and we as people of the world, I believe that we don't love Jesus as much as we should. And my goal is through this message is to have you love him just a little bit more. Have, you think you love him now. I'm hoping that afterwards you'll love him even more. The Christians... I don't think the average Christian is in love with him. I already said that. I'm going to take you down a path the week before the crucifixion. We who are saved will not be going to heaven if Jesus Christ had not been crucified on that cross. If it wasn't him dying for us. It's not about what we can give up, but what he gave up for us. I think a lot of times we think we can give up certain things. Or we can make a deal with God. Or, or we can do this. Or we can do that. But I'm telling you right now, it's not about that. It's what he gave up for us. Do you realize that he came down to earth and he was born in a manger? The King of kings, the Lord of lords, God's only son came down here and born in a lowly manger. He could have had the biggest mansion in the world, but he decided to be born in a barn. And then can you imagine all those times walking around and listening to people, knowing that, hey, I made that. Hey, I made this. Hey, I made that human body. Hey, I made that rock. Hey, I made this earth. And people were asking him all these questions, and, and you would see him fumbling around with things and trying to do things on their own. And how he would say, hey, I did that too. Hey, I could help you with that if you just ask me. But no one would ask him. They would never trust him. They would never ask him. They always wanted to do it on their own. Hollywood has made a mockery out of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Don't believe it. It was way worse than they could ever say. Way worse than they could ever show on TV. 
And when they start talking about Moses and when they start talking about Noah, don't believe them there either. They're wrong. They're taking this book and they're making a mockery out of it just so they can sell tickets, just so they can show people. The first G thing that Jesus experienced, and if you have your Bibles, turn with me. If not, it's okay. Matthew chapter 27, verse number 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests. The first thing that he observed was betrayal. The very first thing that Jesus observed that week before the week of the cross, before the week before he went to die on that cross, the very first thing that he observed, the very first thing that he went through, the very first thing that he experienced was betrayal. Now, I think you're thinking right now, you're thinking, hey, I've been betrayed. Hey, I know exactly what Jesus is going through. Hey, I've had my best friend betray me. Hey, I've had somebody do this to me behind my back. Hey, I know exactly what he's going through. I'm telling you, there's no way we can know what he's going through until we've been nailed on a cross and killed and whipped with a cat of nine tails. There's nothing we can know what he's going through unless we've went through that. Yeah, we've been betrayed, and yeah, we've had someone turn their back on us and do different things. But I'm telling you, our betrayal did not end up with our death. Our betrayal did not end up with us being nailed on a cross. Let's look at Matthew chapter 26, verse 47. I'm going to go fast, don't worry, so bear with me. 47 says this, And while he yet spake, and while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master. And he kissed him. He kissed him. Betrayal. I'm talking a friend that was so close, so close that he kissed him. I'm talking you got to be pretty close when you kiss somebody. There's only two men in this world that I kiss. My, well, probably four. I got two boys and I got my brother and my dad. Those are the only four men that I've ever kissed. Okay? And sorry, guys, that's the only four men I ever will kiss. Okay? I'm telling you right now. But I'm telling you that to show you this. I'm telling you that to show you this. Judas was so close to him. He was so close. He had been there when Jesus healed people. He had been there when Jesus had, had brought the, the dead back to life when he raised Lazarus. He had been there and talked to him. He had been there and ate breakfast with him. He had been there and ate supper with him. He had been there and ran around with him. I'm talking a close, close, close friend. So close that he kissed him. He betrayed him with a kiss. And you think you got it bad. I'm talking Jesus felt betrayal. He felt betrayal to the utmost. Because his best friend betrayed him. One of his good friends. One of the twelve. One of the closest friends betrayed him. And he betrayed him with a kiss. A kiss was one of the most intimate, intimate symbols in the Jewish faith that you could give to a friend. It was something that showed you were super close to him. That you loved him if it was a man. It wasn't anything sensual. It wasn't anything like that. He wasn't uh, have feelings for him. I'm talking about a love that we can never understand sometimes and never see between two men to where he loved him so much that he kissed him. He was one of his greatest friends, one of his closest friends. Imagine that person betraying you, betraying you with a kiss. Jesus knew exactly what he was coming for. He knew it. He was no dummy. He saw Judas coming. He saw Judas coming. What are these guys coming with these swords? What are these guys coming with these sticks? He didn't say that. He already knew. You know why he knew it? Because he was doing it for me, and he was doing it for you. Amen. That's why he faced that betrayal. That's why he did it. That's why he allowed himself to get put through that. It was for us, because he loved us so much, that's why he did it. He already knew he was coming. He already knew he had the swords and the knives and things like that. He already knew all those things. But he, he saw him, and he loved him, and he kissed him. He was close to him. He was a friend. He didn't face betrayal with a knife. He didn't face betrayal with a gun like we do in this day and age. He faced betrayal with a kiss. With the kiss. He was close enough to say my friend. He betrayed him with a kiss. Look what Jesus' response was in verse 50. And Jesus said unto him, he came at him with knives, staves, a kiss. What did Jesus say? All Jesus said was friend. Friend, wherefore art thou come? He could have said anything he wanted to, but he said friend. He did that for me and you. He suffered that betrayal for me and you. That's what he did. He did it for me and you. 
we would have retaliated. We would have punched him back. We would have slapped him off, said, don't kiss me, you're no friend of mine. Get away from me. He didn't do that at all. He did that because he loves us. He betrayed, but he said friend. Number two, he experienced false accusation. Don't turn to it, but I'm going to read it to you. 27, chapter, verse number 59. He experienced accusation. And when Joseph... Oh, that, false accusation. 26, 27. Twenty six verse fifty nine. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Did you hear that? They found what? They found none. Yea, though many of these false witnesses came, yet they found none. And at last there came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing? What is it which thy witnesses against thee? But Jesus held his peace and said to the high priest, Answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ or the Son of God. Jesus saying unto them, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of this witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. Nothing they could say against him was blasphemy. He, did, he, he faced false accusation. He feeds, they could find no false witness against Jesus. They tried and tried and tried, and they couldn't find anybody. They could tell that he was a false, that he, he had lied, that anyone he could, they couldn't dig up any dirt on our Savior. He went about doing good. He went about healing. He went about healing people and preaching, and no one could ever find anything bad about him. I'm guaranteeing you right now, if they look for something close enough for me, they're going to find something bad about me. I can tell you that right now. But they never found anything because of it. He faced false accusation. He faced betrayal by a friend with a kiss. And then he faced false accusation because he loved you. Nothing they could say against him was blasphemy. He said he'd tear the temple down. He said he'd raise it up in three days. That was the truth. He said, I and my father are one. That was the truth. He said, I can go to my father. That was the truth. He never lied. There was no guile in him. There was no sin in him. He would never lie to anyone. He would never hurt anyone. He would never do anything like that. And they tried to bear false witness against him. They tried to find something wrong with him. They couldn't find it, no matter how hard they tried. Jesus was the Son of God. If somebody faced... If somebody had false accusations against me, or you, we would put a billboard up. We would try to, to spare our name. We'd plaster it all over the internet. We'd hire a lawyer. We would try to wrong, right the wrong. We would try to clean our name up. We would try to make ourselves look better. There was nothing they could find against him. Everything he said was true. Everything he said that's going to come true in the future is true. There was nothing they could find wrong against him. He experienced betrayal. He experienced false accusation. All because of you and all because of me. Why? Why would anybody go through that? I have no idea, but it's because he loved us, and he did it for me, and he did it for you, and that's why he did it. And I'll never know why he, why he would love someone like me, but I'm not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I'm going to take it. I'm going to accept him. That's what I'm going to do. Matthew chapter 27, verse 17 and 18. I want to show you something else. I know it's kind of a Bible study this morning, but... This is what God told me to do, so I'm going to listen to him. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. He also experienced envy. Now, I looked this up in the Hebrew, and in the envy, it means, it means spite. Now, spite is basically jealousy on steroids. Okay? They were so jealous. They were so mad at him. They spited him. Spite is where you're so jealous, you're so envious of someone that you want to have them beat up or you want to have them beat beyond recognition or you want to harm them. You want to take your anger out against them. That's what spite is. They spited our Savior. They spited Jesus because of us. They spited him because they couldn't stand the fact that he was going out and he was healing people and he was taking people that were so-called dirty, lowly people that would never, ever been able to enter into the tabernacle or enter into the, the temple. They weren't good enough to go into the temple. 
And he went out to them. And he was able to get them saved. And he was able to preach to them. I can picture that leper like I talked, I think, two weeks ago about that leper that was unclean and how Jesus went right over to him. He made a beeline for him. All these religious, religious, religious Pharisees, they, they, uh, they, they hung out with Jesus and they were just hanging around him just to watch what was going on. And they, and they took and they, they couldn't believe when he stopped what he was doing to go after that leper. Brother Keith, will you open that back window, please? without making it a big distraction. But no matter what, Jesus would stop. No matter what, He would stop for the one. He always stopped for the one. He always saw the one was important. They hated that about Him. They couldn't stand that about Him. They spited that. And that's why they nailed Him to that cross. That's why they whipped Him. He experienced betrayal. He experienced false accusations. And then He experienced spite. That was what He experienced. Why did He do that? For me and you. He did that for us. He did that because He loves us. Because He cares for us. And he, he means so much to me. And I pray that today He would mean so much to you. Their religious was torn down. Their tradition. Jesus of Galilee had done so much good. Spite was somebody that they wanted to hurt. It's you're so jealous. Oh, they're so good. Oh, they're so always helping people. I can't stand them. I can't stand to even look at them. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're letting into our church. Look at all the people that can be saved. The Bible says everybody can. I don't care where they come from. I don't care what their nationality. I don't care what their economic status is. Christ doesn't care. He came to die for all. And He came to die for us. And He suffered all of this because of that. I want to read one more thing. Verse number 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of twain you will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith to them, But what shall that I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil had he done? Pilate couldn't find anything evil about him. Why? This is not an evil man. This is a good man. Why do you want him crucified? Why do you spite him so much? Why do you hate him so much? I can't find anything wrong with him. They didn't like him. They, they hated him. They hated what he stood for. Pilate couldn't find any evil with him. They also, the governor answered, said to them, Whether the twain will you be released? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said, What shall I do with Jesus? The governor said, Why? And Pilate saw that they should prevail nothing, but they rather the tumult was made that he took water and washed it in his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Look at me. This point right here in the Bible, this point gets me every time, Harry, because this was the closest point that Christ was to being released. He was almost there, Kenny. They were almost going to let him go. They were already scourged him. They'd already been mean to him. They'd already hit him. They'd already done all this thing. And he'd been in prayer. They had a false accusation against him. They'd already had a, a mock trial that was, that was so hokey that the, the, the witnesses were fake and the judge was fake and everything was all fake. And they accused him. And this is the one point in the Bible where he was so close to being set free. He was so close. Pilate said, I can't find any evil in this man. How about I give you Barabbas instead? How about we... How about we crucify Barabbas, who really deserves it, and we let this innocent guy go. We let this guy that I can find no evil with, let's let him go. But they said no. They wanted Barabbas. This was the closest that he came to. This was the closest thing. He experienced at this time, he experienced betrayal, experienced false accusation. He, he experienced uh, all these things. Number four was sympathy without commitment. Pilate had sympathy on him. I can't find anything wrong with this guy. I've checked him out. He's a guy, good guy. He don't back talk me. He don't fight. He don't do any of that. He didn't even try to get out of it when they tied him up, when they tried to bind him and try to keep him. He didn't try to get out of any of that. He just sat there and took it all. You want to know why? For me and you. That's why he took it. Because he loves us so much. That's why he took that beating for us. That's why he took all that false accusation. That's why he didn't get a billboard. That's why he didn't try to make himself look better than he was and things like that. He was awesome. I'm sorry, I can't. he didn't try to do like we would do. When I say we try to make ourselves look better than we were to other people, he didn't try any of that. He just sat there and took it. Pilate had sympathy, sympathy without commitment. He sympathized. He understood this guy's innocent, but he wasn't going to do anything about it. 
he wasn't ready to commit. He wasn't ready to stand up and do anything about it. That sounds like a lot of people I know. They're not willing to do anything about it. Last point. Here's a message in a nutshell. There was one more man that allowed Jesus to experience one more thing. He'd been through all these other things. Judas betrayed him. The men in the court, they blasphemed him. Pilate had sympathy for him, but he wouldn't commit to letting him loose. Along the way were there men that Jesus, that he experienced something by their hand. And this is nothing compared to, I could tell you what the Roman soldiers did to him. But uh, I'm not going to. Jesus experienced something. This is my message in a nutshell. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50 through 59. This is a good Bible right here. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And there came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things which were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. That amazes me every time I read it. And many women were beholding afar off, which followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to them, among which one was Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's children. When the even was come, there came a rich man of Arimathea, named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. He covered it up. The first thing that they did, the world, I don't know if you know it or not, but the world, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm giving you a history lesson, maybe this is all opening your eyes this morning, maybe you're, you don't know which way to to think or look, but I'm telling you right now that this world, they can't stand Jesus. They can't stand our Savior. I'm telling you right now, it's a proof. We all think that things have changed since back then. Oh, that was Bible days. I'm telling you the truth. They can't stand our Savior. They can't stand Jesus. They, love, they want to run from Him. They want to get away from Him. He convicts them and he, he makes them see their sin and things like that, and they can't stand it. And what they did on that cross, not only did they crucify Him, but you got to understand something. His mom was right there when they crucified him. His friends were right there when they crucified him. They ripped his clothes off. They hung him on that cross with no clothing. He was naked while they were uh, whipping him with the cat of nine tails. They wanted to humiliate him. They wanted to shame him. That was the most shameful death for the king of all kings that could have ever went through. That's what it was. The world wanted to shame him. But one man... One rich man, the Bible says. One rich man, Joseph of Arimathea. He was, uh, he was actually on the council when they sought false accusation against Jesus. I think he was, he was a, a part of the Sanhedrin, and he was, he was, uh, he was there, and, and he didn't vote either way. You want to crucify him? I abstain. He, he was like Switzerland. He was neutral. Man, we can't be like that. I'd rather be for a guy that says no or yes. I'd rather be for a guy that doesn't stand in the middle. He stood right on the fence. And he let it happen. And then he did this. The Bible says that he was saved. The Bible says that he trusted Jesus, he believed Jesus, he followed him around, he was one of his disciples. In verse 59 it says, and when jo In 58 he went to Pilate and he begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. The world had shamed Jesus. The world had shamed him. I had a cousin one time. I still have him. He's still alive, praise the Lord. But he got hurt at work. And he worked at the Jeep plant. And he fell down an elevator shaft. And he, fell, he, he rode his golf cart down the elevator shaft. The elevators at the old plant would go up and down. They would, they would come halfway in the opening and do different things like that. Sometimes they would work. Sometimes they wouldn't work. One time it, went, it was about this far up, and there was an opening. And he popped the gate open, talking to another guy, rode his golf cart in. Rode his golf cart in and went face first down into this elevator shaft. Don't know how many feet he got, but they went down there and they rescued him. And I remember going into the hospital, and I remember seeing him. 
And I can only equate it to what the Bible says with the trauma that they put Christ through. And I mean his hands and his arms and every piece of his body was just black and blue and red. And they had bandages on him. And even though they were clean bandages, that blood would still come through no matter what at different places. They were constantly having to change his bandages. Constantly having to keep him covered up. And the trauma that Christ must have went through on that cross. On not only betrayal... And not only false accusation, and not only sympathy without commitment, but he went through all that for us. And that vicious beating that he went through for us. And Joseph of Arimathea, he took him. No doubt they dropped him off. He was naked. They had shamed our Savior. They did whatever they could do to shame him. And he took the body. He begged for the body. He didn't care what anybody thought anymore. He didn't care what anybody said about him. He said, I'm going to get him. I love him. I care for him. That wasn't just a body to him. That wasn't just a body that they were going to dump off. That was Jesus. That was Jesus as Savior. In this whole world, they want to shame him. And they want to throw him down. And they want to throw him on the ground. And they want to kick him. But Joseph of Arimathea, he took him. And he took a brand new linen. A fine linen. And he covered him up. And he covered him up. And no doubt I can picture Brother Harry when they covered him up. And he, there was no blood left in that body. But they covered him up. And just like on my cousin, those bandages, no doubt where his hands were, they probably crossed his hands. And, and I can picture that, seriously, man, this does something to me because this had to be one, one intimate time with Joseph to take in his Savior that he loved and seen and folding his hands and covering him up with his fine linen and being ever so gentle with him. These Roman soldiers had beat him and hurt him, and they were nowhere near gentle with him. And he took him and he covered him up. And he folded this blanket over him. And I can see it now where his head was. Probably the blood started to come through the white linen. And probably where his hands were, the blood had started to come through the linen. And probably where his feet and where his side, the blood started to come through. I'm telling you right now, this is my message in a nutshell. All right? This old world, they want to shame the Savior. And they want to put him on, a, on, a, a, on the ground and they want to throw him down and they don't want to ever see him again. And I'm telling you, how about we as Christians, so-called Christians or whatever we call ourselves, that we're saved. How about we take him and we cover up his shame? How about we live our lives so that his shame is covered up? And that they see the blood instead. How about we let them see the blood of our Savior? How about we let them see the power of His blood? How about we see how His blood changes lives? And how it heals people? How it takes people to heaven? How it saves lives? How about we do that? How about instead of worrying about what the world thinks and worrying about what somebody's going to say and letting them shame Him? How about when we get on that job site and they say something about it and say, Hold up, that's my Savior. How about when we say, Hey, we ought to do this. Hold up, that's my Savior, Jesus. I'm not going to do that to him. Hasn't he experienced enough? Hasn't he experienced enough all through the crucifixion that we got to live the way we got to live as Christians and drag his name through the mud some more? Let's give him what he deserves. Let's give him love. The love and the tenderness and the kind compassion that he loves. Don't let them shame him. Let them see the blood. Let them see the blood how we live. Let them see that, hey, I don't, how are you making it? The only way I'm making it is through the blood of Jesus Christ. He forgave me all my sins. How are you making it through this hard time? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. How do, how do I get my life fixed? How do, I, how do I get these answers? How? The only one way, through the blood of Jesus Christ. How about we do that? How about instead of shaming him, how about we go get him? How about we beg for his body? He begged for his body. Please let me have his body. Please let me have it. It, was, it wasn't just a body to him. It was Jesus. How about we do that as Christians? 